Good morning, Compass. Wow, look at all the people. Real quick, I want you to go to the Compass Facebook page and check in. Tell them you're at the ICE service. <laughs> We're glad you're here. EL told me that we had the second service, that um, everyone will be clapping and singing during the praise time. Is that true? Ah, oh, sweet. All right. Well, good morning. We're glad you're here. If you're watching the service from home, we're glad that you had this. You know, we were able to provide you with this. Um, at this time, would you please stand up and just, just greet each other and tell them good morning. Tell everybody good morning. Get lost in my mistakes What looks to me like weakness Is a canvas for your dream And my story isn't over My story's just begun And fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Yeah, fail you won't define me Cause that's what my father does Welcome. Y'all can be seated. These things work a lot better when you got batteries in them, and I noticed that about 10 seconds ago. <laughs> Welcome to Compass Christian Church. If you're new with us, we're glad that you are here. Uh, there's a little sticker in front of you. If you put your camera on it, you can kind of connect to us. It kind of just like you go to a restaurant, you see a menu. Just let it, it's a little, little dark in here, so it takes a little bit of while, but once it focuses, it'll bring up a little page. You can connect with us. You can also bring up a bulletin. If you didn't grab one, you can pull it up as well on your phone. But hey, it's good. Hey, it's good to be here, right? It's good to be in the Father's house. Amen. Yeah. 
Uh, the church is alive and well, and I hope y'all know the church is y'all. The church is the people, and um, when we get together and we gather together, uh, that, that's, that's who we are, and that's what we represent. We represent the church, and we represent the body of Christ. So it's good to have y'all here this morning. Glad y'all are able to come out. We hope that you're, uh, that you're safe on the way home. Uh, if you don't have power, we hope that that power is back on when you get home, uh, but we're glad that we're able to worship Jesus and worship our Lord. Um, I, I'm going to start off with a word of prayer. Uh, and then we're going to get things going. I just will say this. Our praise team is, they, they just keep on rolling. Uh, we had one girl get stuck in New Kent with ice stuff, couldn't get out of the driveway, so she couldn't come. We had another girl that they really needed in kids' area, so she went over there. So Tommy's singing. We had our electrician guitarist guy. Electrician. <laughs> <laughs> Electric. <laughs> boom, guitarist. He's on the drums, as you can tell, because our drummers, is he was in the mountains somewhere out there in Rapid Air, and he couldn't come back. So we shuffled everything around, but hey, we're still glorifying God. Amen? Amen. That's right. All right, let us pray. God, you're awesome, and uh, thank you, Father, uh, just for, for your son, Jesus, and, and what he gives each and every single one of us. He gives us the chance of freedom, freedom in Christ. So, Lord, for the Christian that is here, we are just so thankful, Lord, that they're here, uh, that they are building upon their faith. For the person that came in here maybe seeking or searching or still hasn't made that commitment, Lord, we pray. We pray that, uh, that when Mike preaches the word, Lord, that they will be able to, to understand uh, that they can hear the word, the truth spoken. And, Lord, that they might fall in love with you. Uh, God, we just thank you so much for all that you have given us. We thank you for a, for a body here at Compass that, uh, just, that loves you and loves people. And, uh, Lord, we're trying to do our best to, uh, to bring as many people to Jesus Christ. Lord, allow us to be ambassadors for him. Allow us to, to just to be that spiritual compass that we're directing people to Christ so they might find and, and be find and follow Jesus Christ, Lord, that they can put all their heart into him. Lord, we love you, and uh, we thank you, and I pray all this now in his name. Amen. I did have one other thing to say. Uh, most of y'all know we've been, we've been really saying, hey, we're going to start move, we're going to start move, we're going to start move. It's going to be on Valentine's Day. It's going to be on February 14th. Well, we move, move to next week, all right, because we want to make sure everybody's here, our regular attendance. So today's just kind of a standalone. Mike worked on a message this week in case we had to do this. So my message could be just for the, uh, the start of next week. So uh, I hope y'all understand that. But y'all make sure you're here on the 21st. It will be the biggest thing that we have done in our church's life, you know, and that's going back to Pole Green, Liberty, you know, this is one of the biggest things that we're going to try to challenge ourselves with, so y'all make sure you're here next week. It's good to be able to see you on this, on this Lord's Day. Today's February 14th, Valentine's Day. Fellas, if this is the first time you're realizing that, you're probably in trouble, okay? I'm just going to say that. But Valentine's Day is a day that we usually show a little bit more attention to those that we love. The question is, how do we do that? I mean, the florist tells me that the way that I show love to my wife is to buy her flowers. Hallmark tells me I need to send her a card. Russell Stover tells me to buy her a box of candy. Jared, the jeweler, tells me that I should buy her a necklace or maybe a ring. And, of course, Olive Garden tells me that I need to take her out for a meal fit for a queen. So, you see, it's not as simple showing love to those that we love. The simple has seemed to be made more complex. But the wonderful thing is, as we look to the scriptures, we find a very simple formula on how we're to love. In fact, it's such a simple formula, it's almost not worth looking at. But since this is Valentine's Day, I want us to look at a formula to love. More specifically, on how we love others. Jesus said it this way in John, the 13th chapter. He said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another, Jesus said. And then he qualified it by saying, by this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. One commentary I read said that love should be the distinguishing mark of a Christian follower. But the ability to love others doesn't always come easy, does it, folks? In fact, for some of us, it takes an earnest effort to show our love to maybe someone that isn't as lovable. But I want you to understand, Jesus commands us as followers of his that we're to love one another. And so what I want to do is I want us to share with you just uh, today on how we can do that, how we can practice loving others. I know that may be a simple principle to state, but it's often easy, it's often hard or not easy to put into practice because so often it goes against our human nature to love people the way that they should be loved. I remember somebody said at one time, how come it is that we treat the, pe the people that we love the most, we treat the worst? If you think about it, you go home and you argue with your wife or your kids or your husband, 
And yet those are the ones that you love the most. Those are the ones who are probably going to cry the most at your funeral. And yet, like he said there, it's hard to sometimes show love to those that we should love the most. Now, today's message is going to come from the book of Romans, chapter 12, this morning. So if you have your Bibles with you, or if you've got a smartphone that's got a Bible app, go ahead and get it out and turn with us to that New Testament book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. Now, I know some of you are probably surprised that I didn't choose 1 Corinthians 13. If you're familiar, 1 Corinthians 13 is that love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind, etc., etc. But I think Romans chapter 12, starting at verse 9, is such a great passage of Scripture that talks about how we ought to love one another that what I want to do this morning is simply go through a few of those verses, verse by verse. I'll constantly refer back to that, so if you would, just follow along with me as we do so. The first section, as we pick up here in Romans chapter 12, picking up in verse 9, talks about, well, I'm just going to put a smile on my face and say talks about people like myself. People who are easy to love. You know what I'm talking about? I think that, and as I say that, my wife's probably back here saying, huh, if you only knew. But nevertheless, Romans chapter 12, picking up in verse 9, says that love must be sincere. In other words, love must be truthful, folks. You're never going to feel good about yourself. You're never going to feel good about your life. You're never going to feel good about your relationship if you're living a lie. Sincere love, Paul says, doesn't pretend. There's no hypocrisy in that. Now, I think Jesus portrayed for us the best example of that. Do you remember the account that Jesus had or the encounter that Jesus had with the woman at the well in John chapter 4? Remember Jesus had carried on this conversation with her and told her to go back and get her husband? And do you remember what her response was? She said, I have no husband. Now, was she being honest there? Well, you might say, well, technically she was, but you know most of the story. She didn't have a husband. But I believe it was at that moment that her conversation with Jesus began to feel a little awkward because she wasn't being completely honest with Jesus. In fact, Jesus, sensing that, said to her, you're right when you say you have no husband. The truth of the matter is you have five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't your husband. Somebody referred to her as the Linda Wolf of Samaria. Does the name Linda Wolf sound familiar? Well, Linda Wolf has been married 25, or excuse me, 23 times over the past 50 years. 23 different marriages. Now, her last hut marriage was to a fellow by the name of Glenn Wolf, who holds the distinction of being the most married man. He had been married 29 times himself before he died several years ago. By the way, Linda Wolf at age 69 says she's now looking for husband number 24. But back to Jesus and the woman at the well. When honesty came into that conversation, then the relationship between Jesus and this woman then moved on to the next level, did it not? Because if you recall, when Jesus confronted, about, confronted her about those live-in relationships, it's at that point that she begins to ask those spiritual questions. Folks, you ever told a lie to someone? What happens? Well, you begin to feel awkward around that person, do you not? Because you're afraid they're going to catch you in that lie. And so what happens, your relationship with them begins to be strained. Have you ever gone to someone and told them that you told a lie? I'm sure some of you are thinking, are you crazy, man? That's the last thing I'm going to do. But if you ever do, you'll realize that your relationship with that person can move on to a greater level. You see, sincere love, and that's what Paul's talking about here, sincere love is being transparent with people. It's letting them see you for who you are, flaws and all. Now, Paul goes on in the rest of verse 9 by saying to hate what is evil and to cling to what is good. Notice it doesn't say hate who is evil, but it says hate what is evil. One writer says it like this, you cannot love deeply without hating proportionately. I know that sounds confusing, but let me try to explain what he meant. He said if you love your child, then you're going to hate what drugs or alcohol or anything that harms your child does to your child. If you love your spouse, then you're going to hate anything or anyone that seeks to harm or to hurt your spouse. And if you love God, that's what he says, and if you love the people of God, then you're going to hate the things that threaten the people of God. You can love what is good, and you can hate what is evil. And I've noticed that if you don't have the courage to stand against evil, then you usually feel lousy about yourself. But when you take a stand, when you boldly stand for what is right, and when you oppose what is evil, then not only is it a boost to your witness, but it's also a boost to your self-confidence. 
Think of the times that you've passed up saying, standing up for something that was right. How did you feel afterwards? Your friends use offensive language and you just stand by. They begin to talk about someone and you don't step in and discourage it. They do something dishonest and by your silence, you seem to show acceptance or approval. That's what Paul means when he says, love what is good, but hate what is evil. Then Paul goes on to say, you be loyal too. In verse 10, he says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Now listen to me when I say this. The one thing that you can do in any relationship is to be loyal. You may not be super talented. You may not be rich or wealthy, but you can be loyal. And the truth is, when you're disloyal to a friend, you never feel good about yourself. Remember Simon Peter when he denied that he even knew Jesus? The Bible says that when when Jesus overheard this, he turned and looked at Peter, and the Bible says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. Peter felt terrible about himself because he had been disloyal. And if you've ever betrayed a friend, even if it was to your advantage temporarily, when it is concluded, you don't feel good about yourself. Because deep down inside, you know that you've been disloyal. And that's why the Apostle Paul says you're to honor one another above yourself. Now, I realize this is a tough command because instinctively we're selfish. But the key to any relationship, hear me when I say this, the key to any relationship is to be unselfish. And if you ever get to the point where you can put the interests of other people above yourselves, then not only does that relationship with them deepen, but you feel better about yourself as well. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and following, the Apostle Paul challenges us not to do anything out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, Paul says, consider others better than yourselves. And then he challenges us not to look to our own interests, but to the interest of others, Paul says. And then he qualifies it by saying, your attitude should be that of the same of Jesus Christ. And what did Jesus do? He forgot all about himself. And went to the cross. And for that, God exalted him. And so, folks, I'm I'm here to remind you that when you forget about yourself, when you put the interests of others above yourself, then God will exalt you. I know that's kind of a paradox there, opposing statements. But you see, all of our lives that we think we're going to be fulfilled if we can just find somebody that's going to love us. But in reality, life is only fulfilled when we love others. Now look down at verse 11 where Paul continues and says, And never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. You know, one of the things I enjoy most about this church, but I enjoy about almost any church, but at least this church, is the enthusiastic people. Just the fact that you ventured out this morning. Now, for those of you who are still online, for those of you who had to stay home this morning, I understand completely. But I'm thrilled when you step outside despite the weather and the road conditions You ventured out this morning, and as we got started this morning, you sang with enthusiasm. Uh, When E.L. challenged you to an amen or whatever, you give that to him. I just love being around people who are enthusiastic. I don't understand why some people can go to ball games and shout at the top of their lungs and can watch television for hours and laugh and cry and enjoy the program, but yet when they come to church, all of a sudden they become so passive. Don't you know that God wants you to be enthusiastic when it comes to serving in the church? There you go. I didn't ask for that, but I will certainly take it this morning. And I certainly think God wants you to be enthusiastic when we come together to worship and honor him. This is a celebration this morning. We're celebrating not only the fact that we serve a risen Savior, but we're celebrating the fact that God is good to us in spite of our shortcomings, in spite of our weaknesses. We need people to be excited for Christ. And many people who will remember throughout their lives how good God has been to them. And when we come together to remind ourselves of that, folks, we ought to come enthusiastically. Amen? Amen. There you go. Listen to me. If it's true that our sins separate us from God for eternity, and it is true, and if it's true that only Jesus Christ and only his death on the cross can forgive us of those sins, and that's true, and if it's true that only when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and our, at that point our sins are forgiven, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and we've got a hope of eternity and it is that everything else in our lives ought to be secondary to that. Did you hear me when I said that? 
Everything that you do is secondary to the fact that you know you've been forgiven by God because of Jesus Christ. And there ought to be an intensity and there ought to be an excitement about our lives because we understand and believe that. Now, some of you say, well, preacher, I'm just not that kind of person. I don't have that kind of personality. I can't act like that. Well, you don't have to adapt someone else's personality. And I'm not asking you to go out here and be rah, rah, rah all the time. But I think others ought to sense that there's something different in your life, that you're able to overcome whatever difficulties, that you're able to weather whatever storms. You've got a smile on your face regardless of whatever's going on in your life. Because, folks, when you do that, it's contagious to other people. When we express enthusiasm in whatever task we have, it not only makes others feel better, but we feel better about ourselves as well. Now, Paul goes on to say in verse 12, he says, be joyful in hope, be patient in affliction, be faithful in prayer. I go back to that first statement, be joyful in hope. What is the hope for the Christian? How can we be joyful in hope? Well, the joy of the Christian is, know, is to know that one day, one day, we're going to go to heaven and we're going to be rewarded for our faithfulness. That's what we have to look forward to. Every funeral that I preach, I can tell the difference whether folks who are saddened because they've lost someone they love and they just don't know about where this person is beyond their death. But then I'll do the funeral of a Christian, of a faithful Christian. And I'll see a family, even in the midst of sadness, still have a sense of joy because they know where their loved one is gone. Folks, there's something that makes us joyful because we have a hope that this world can't offer us. We've got a hope that goes beyond this world. So live your life like that. Look forward with a sense of anticipation to the day in which you're going to receive your reward. You do realize that one day you're going to be rewarded for all that you've gone on through in this earth, do you not? If not, I'm here to remind you of that. Whatever hardships, whatever heartaches you have faced in this life, God will more than make up in eternity. And you need to be reminded of that today. Everything that you're going through in this lifetime is only preparing you for a greater reward in store. I may be telling my age, but I'm going to ask one, some of those of you. Do you remember that old milk commercial that had a boy? He was probably about 10 years old, little scrawny boy, little legs. And he was looking in the mirror at himself, and all of a sudden a picture or a figure popped up of him. It was him probably about five years down the road as a teenager. He was a little bit more muscular and a little bit stronger. And the mirror image in the mirror said to the little boy, the little wiry, skinny boy, said, you drink your milk and you'll look like me someday. You remember in this commercial? And then there was a the next scene where he was a little bit bigger, probably like a senior in high school, looked like he played football a lot bigger then. And he said to the boy, he said, you keep drinking your milk and you're going to look like me. And then all of a sudden there's a college version of him. And he's standing there, probably got a little bit of mustache or beard, I can't remember, but he's looking at his, himself and he says, if, you're gonna, you know, if you continue to drink your milk, you'll look like me. And about that time, this rather attractive blonde-haired girl steps up next to him in the mirror, and she says, and I'll be your girlfriend. And all of a sudden, that little boy can't drink his milk fast enough because he knows what's in store for him, folks. And the Christian ought to have that kind of hope. It's that kind of hope, knowing we have something greater in store for us that ought to bring us joy in this life, regardless of what we may be going through, whether it be as a individual as a church or as a nation there's something greater in store and then paul says be patient in affliction folks you know the bible doesn't promise you to be exempt from heartache right i, I think somebody has fed that lie to the church somehow that we think if we just give our lives to jesus everything's going to be great but that's not what jesus said jesus said in this world you will have trouble why because we live in this world we weren't made for this world. We were made for eternity. You want to know how we were made? Go back to Genesis, before Genesis 3, the fall of man, when God was with man, and the Bible says that they communicated with one another on a daily basis. God desires fellowship with us, his creation. But sin has marred that. And because of that, the world we live in is marred as a result of that sin. And when those difficult times come, and they will because we live in a difficult world, Paul says we're to be joyful. We're to keep waiting patiently. We're to pray faithfully. And folks, let me say this. When you are faithful to the Lord, even in the midst of heartaches, other people are inspired by that, especially when you're faithful in adversity. And to be honest, when it's all over, you'll feel better about yourself. 
Now let's look down at verse 13. Paul goes on to say, share with God's people who are in need, practice hospitality. Now I realize the world will tell you the opposite. The world will say to really feel good about yourself, what you need to do is accumulate wealth. And then you're going to feel good about yourself. You'll feel important. But the Bible emphasizes just the opposite. The way, to feel, the way to feel really good about yourself, the Bible says, is to give away as much as possible. That's what Jesus meant when he said in Luke chapter 6, verse 38, he says, give, and it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure that you use, and I want you to listen to this, this is what you need to understand, for the measure that you use, it will be measured to you. So you really want to feel good about yourself? You really want to practice loving others? Then forget about your problems. Find someone else who is in need, and you pour yourself out to them. Then you'll see how life takes on value. And practice hospitality, Paul said. Folks, one tangible way that I think we can express love is to love to our friends is to practice hospitality. I realize because of COVID, we've been placed under all these restrictions, but prior to COVID or here in the next few months, hopefully when we get out of this, how quick will you be to invite someone into your home? Somebody who's not a part of your family, somebody who's not a part of your clique. You see, I know it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of cost to, to take someone into your home, invite someone into your home, but, but you'll see what a blessing it is, folks. And you'll see how you feel better about yourself when you practice hospitality. Now let's move on, verses 14 through 16. Here Paul gives some instructions about those who, well, let's just say those who are, find it a little more difficult to love. You know anybody like that? Don't call out any names. Don't point to anybody in the crowd. But you know people who are just a little bit more difficult to love. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, beginning with verse 32. He said, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those to, from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. And then this is where Jesus gets serious. But love your enemies, he said. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward, that's what we've been talking about, then your reward will be great and you will be the sons of the Most High. You see, folks, I think the real test of Christian love is how do we respond to people who aren't as likable? The Apostle Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 12, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, live in harmony with one another. Don't be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position, do not be conceited. I remember hearing a preacher tell a story one time, and I hope I can tell this right, so uh, please don't misread into it. But he was telling about the time that he was working a senior high week of camp, and he said because of some obligation Sunday, he couldn't get there until late that evening. So he was one of the last ones to arrive, and he said as he was getting the stuff out of his trunk, there's a girl that made her way over to him, and he said when she came up onto him, she said it was, she was, you could tell, a girl who really struggled to make friends. He said she wasn't very attractive, and her posture was rather poor, stringy hair, thick glasses, buck teeth, obviously looking for someone who would be her friend. And she came running up to him, never met him before in her life, and she said to him, she said, I hope you're on my team. And the preacher said, well, inside I thought, I hope I'm not, because I think you're going to be rather much of a leech all week long. He said, I unpacked my belongings in the dormitory, then my, my, made my way down to the cafeteria. I was the last person in line, and after I got my tray, I looked around the whole cafeteria, and there was only one seat available, and it was right across from that rather unattractive girl. Nobody even wanted to sit by her. The preacher said, I sat there, and I tried to initiate a conversation, but it was very awkward. And then at the end of the meal, the dean got up and said, now this is a crowded week, and we want to be as orderly as possible, so let's just make for the rest of the week where you're sitting tonight be your seat all week long. He said, for the next week, three, days a day, three meals a day, I ate in front of this girl. But then he said, when she began to relax and I began to try and pay attention to her, I quickly discovered that under that rather unattractive exterior was a brilliant and very spiritually deep young woman. 
and we became friends. He said on Saturday when I was packing my car again, she came running across the camp, embraced me, and kissed me on my cheek. He said if she had done that at the beginning of the week, I would have lost it. But he said that kiss on the cheek made my week. And I felt so good about myself as I was driving home that day because I knew for once that I had begun to see people the way that God sees them. Not from the outward appearance, but from the heart. Folks, self-fulfillment is not found in self-gratification. Gathering around people that make you look good. Self-fulfillment is found in self-sacrificing. Giving yourself to people who aren't always so easy to love. You know anybody like that? Well, the final three verses, and I'll close with this, is Paul talks about speaking those who, well, let's just say those who seem impossible to love. You know anybody like that? Again, don't call out names or point to anybody. But Paul says in verse 17, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Now, Paul is talking about people who are deliberately trying to harm you. Not only do they object to your beliefs, but they're determined to inflict injury on you as well. They may slander your reputation. They may pressure you with financial loss. They may even seek to do you bodily harm. But for some reason, these people despise you, and they would delight in your fall. Now, I know the natural reaction is to retaliate, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. I'll get even is what we say. But when somebody hurts us, we want to hurt them back. We want, when we get hit unfairly, we want to hit back. But verses 17 and 18 tells us, do not repay anyone evil for evil, be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. And if it's possible, as far as it depends upon you, Paul says, you live at peace with everyone. Now, folks, I realize sometimes that's not possible. In fact, with some people, it may be impossible. That's why we've got to learn to restrain our anger and not to lash out in retaliation, Paul says. See, you see, you could jump all over people, and you might feel better about yourself, but in the short term, and, and that may be in the short term, but in the long term, you're going to feel bad. And how do I know that? Because I've been there. I've lashed back out at people, only to realize that a short time later, I shouldn't have done that. I should have taken the high road. I should have done what God says, and that's not to repay evil for evil. Now, there, real quickly, there are two ways that I think that we can deal with impossible people. Two things that we need to understand. Number one is you've got to trust God's justice. Paul says in verse 19 of Romans chapter 12, Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to revenge. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, when we attempt to make someone pay for the wrong that they've done to us, or maybe the people that we love, we're just going to mess it up. This is God's territory, according to Paul here. You're usurping his throne. By the way, only God knows the circumstances, by the way. And only he judges correctly. And if we need discipline, then he'll discipline them in love. But the Bible does promise that he will administer justice. And so what we have to do is we have to trust in God's timing. And, we'll, and eventually you'll see justice served. Now, folks, you've got to believe that. Because if you don't, it'll eat you up inside. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 says, Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. A man will reap what he sows. So you have to trust that God will make that happen. I think it was A.W. Tozer who said, The wheels of God's justice may grind slowly, but they grind exceedingly fine. God will deal with it. The second key, and I'll close, to loving an impossible person is to express God's love. Look at verse 20 of our text. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. The Bible says if you have an enemy, don't cause him grief. Don't give him, or excuse me, don't give him grief. Don't, don't give, instead extend kindness. Give him something to eat. Give him something to drink. I would say cut his grass. Take him chocolate chip cookies. Send a note of encouragement. Because when you take the high road, by your actions, you may end that hostility altogether. But even if you don't, at least you're going to feel better about yourself. And then Paul says, don't be overcome evil, but overcome evil with good. By the way, that's what Jesus did. 
They spit on him. They beat him with their fists. They mocked him. And they nailed him to the cross. And even though that old hymn sings, he could have called 10,000 angels. Instead, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So you want to know the proper way to celebrate Valentine's Day today? That is to practice loving other people. And it's so simple that sometimes we miss it. We put God first. We'll put people next. We put ourselves last. And if you think that's so simple, then I dare you to try it. And regardless of what happens to you, you'll know that for your life, that your life is counting for something in eternity. And folks, that's the greatest feeling we can ever have. I'm going to ask our praise team to come back up. And as they do, I'm just going to ask you to be mindful for just a moment of what I've just said. The challenge is for you to practice loving others. To, of course, put God first. Isn't that what Jesus said when he was asked what the greatest commandments were? Jesus said the greatest commandment, number one commandment, was to do what? Love God first with all your whole, whole with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then Jesus said the second greatest commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. And so I would challenge you to put those two things into practice. Love God first. Love your neighbor second. Put yourself last. And when you do, God will honor you for that. Pray with me. Father, thank you for that reminder today. And I pray that as we celebrate this Valentine's Day with those that we love, that certainly we would express our love to them in any way and every way possible. But Father, I pray that we also would be challenged as Christians. We would practice that same kind of love with everyone we come in contact with, those who are easy to love, those who we find it a little bit more difficult to love, and even those that we find it impossible to love. Because Jesus modeled for us what that was. As he hung on that cross, for him to cry out that you would forgive those who brought him harm, Father, is the greatest demonstration of love that we could ever have witnessed. And for that, I pray that it would be a challenge for us to be like Jesus and be quick to forgive and quick to extend love. Because then by doing so, Father, we become the people that you've called us to be. Forgive us for those times that we fail to do that. We pray in Jesus. We're going to offer an invitation now. And the reason we're offering this invitation is our hope is that you might see your need to surrender your life to Jesus today. You know, I said earlier, God said the first and greatest commandment is to love God. And so it begins by you loving God. And God asks us to love him by demonstrating our love by, to Jesus as we surrender our lives to him. And this is an opportunity for you to do that publicly. Jesus said if we confess him before men, he will confess us before our Father in heaven. And so we give you an opportunity to confess the name of Jesus before this group of people today. All you need to do is simply come forward this morning. I'm going to make my way down front here in just a moment. And I'll be ready to share with you from God's word what you need to do to not only receive the forgiveness that was extended to you, but also the love of God that's extended to you this morning. But it begins by you first surrendering your life to him. So why don't we stand together? Let's sing this next song. And as we do... If you need to give your life to Jesus, why don't you come as we sing this morning?
Completely to you. 